shut the back door. <laughs> okay, welcome everybody. Um, so this is another one of the occasional uh, seminars from the Fire Centre Research Hub that I now direct, the University of Tasmania. Uh, the subject of this seminar is about uh, Indigenous effects on the Tasmanian landscape and therefore it's uh, entirely appropriate that we not only have a, a welcome to country but we have an Indigenous person who can welcome to us country. I think this is a huge privilege. So I'd like to introduce uh, Uncle Dougie Mansell who we're going to be talking about his home, his country and he'd like to welcome us. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like laughing, I don't know why. <coughs> My name is Uncle Dougie Mansell, and I am a proud Tasmanian Aboriginal elder from Cape Barren Island. When I walk on this land, I walk tall, proud and strong. Why? Because it's our land. I respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of this land on which we meet today on the A Sandy Bay campus at the University of Tasmania. It is a privilege to stand on country of my ancestors. My ancestors lived and cared for country for thousands of years. They knew this land intimately and what it offered. They hunted, gathered, held ceremonies, told stories, died and gave birth on country. I honour them. I pay my respects to elders past and present and to the many Aboriginal people that did not make elders status. I honour them. I pay my respects to the Aboriginal community. I honour them. I pay my respects to the Aboriginal people in this room. Today, I honour you. As a young person growing up in the islands in Bass Strait, I have a strong understanding of the island landscapes and cultural practice of mutton birding, which I've had the privilege of doing 50 years of just quietly. In 2014, Simon and his team were invited to study the environment impacts of severe fires on Clark Island. In 2017, the Cape Barren Island Rangers invited Simon to su survey the charcoal records from the wetlands to study the long-term history of the islands. I look forward to hearing about it today. With pride and from the bottom of my heart, I welcome you all to Aboriginal land. Thank you. Um, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Um, because we are going to talk about uh, the history of Tasmania in the talk that Simon um, is going to present. I think one of the things that I really need to reinforce here is that um, scientists have done some terrible things in relation to understanding Aboriginal culture and society, and it is a huge gesture and a huge responsibility that the Tasmanian Aboriginal community reached out first to me and then to Simon and a, a broader group of scientists and invited us to work on their land and trust us. And we have entered into a trust relationship that I take very seriously, very seriously. And this process that we're involved in is an important process of reconciliation. We do not uh, interpret scientific results without consultation. This is part of a consultation process. I want everybody to understand that what is being discussed is still being interpreted and thought about. I'm handing over to Simon. Simon is a distinguished scholar. He's uh, worked at the Smithsonian Institute in the United States, Panama. Uh, he's 
at Cambridge University, the Australian National University is the director of a centre, and his capacity as a director of a centre, he has been responsible for the repatriation of human remains, the repatriation of cultural artefacts that in some cases that were taken in the most uh, unfortunate, disrespectful and unethical way. He completely understands the gravity and the responsibility of working in a cross-cultural environment. And I welcome Simon to talk about our research. Okay, thanks very much. And thanks, Uncle Dougie, for such a warm welcome. And um, yeah, I really appreciate that. And hopefully I can do service to the research we've been doing on, on your country. And um, yeah, hopefully it'll, you'll find it exciting too, as much as I do. Because it's, uh, yeah, some really amazing sort of. Um, information can be gained from looking at uh, not just the current environment, which I know many people here are really engaged with botany and environmental science and so on, um, but looking in the past and in that deeper time is, tells us a lot about um, what makes the present and perhaps the future as well. So that's really my uh, role, I suppose, as a researcher is to try and look at, at the past. Now we're all around um, Australia and in places like New Guinea and elsewhere, but um, yeah, it's a really great privilege to come to uh, Tasmania and, and work with community here and today I hope to give you a sort of an overview, very much an overview of the, um, th this ongoing research which is focused on the Ferno Group or two islands in particular, um, Cape Barren Island and Clark Island but I'll refer them to the um, sort of Aboriginal name that's been given to them, Lung Talanana and um, Truana, um, both uh, referring to those islands. and. Yeah, and, and the work we're doing there with the community. And so today I'll just go through a bit of a background actually, so some of the ideas that um, uh, kind of excited me about uh, working in this region and then some of the, the kind of what we know about particularly fire history and, and fire management through the past, not just in Tasmania but across Australia, um, and then focus in on, on the work we did um, on, on the two islands uh, in the Bass Strait. So yeah, this big idea about what, I, what the title of the talk, that bridge and barrier, and it kind of refers to this amazing change in Australia's, um, the, the islands of New Guinea, Australia, Tasmania, over the last several millennia. And this relates to lowering sea level. And when that happens during the glacial period, you get the island of New Guinea joined to Northern Australia, Torres Strait, and of course, the island of Tasmania joined to the mainland through the Bass Strait. So this was a pathway, like a, a bridge, if you like, for people to actually move through, to live in, and to manage, and to um, you know, ultimately uh, occupy uh, the lands of, of Tasmania many, many millennia ago, probably over 40 millennia ago. And so it's a remarkable story, and one that we don't actually know an awful lot about from a scientific point of view. Of course, Tasmanian Aboriginal people have a deep knowledge of the region, and this is part of being in a partnership, is to learn from one another, I hope. You know, we can be a sort of a two-way learning process that um, everybody benefits from. But so, so yeah, I, I, was, I actually worked quite a lot up in New Guinea as well, and so this original uh, text I've got here, this Bridge and Barrier, Natural and Cultural History of Torres Strait, was one of the things that kind of inspired me about, gee, what actually happens on these um, landscapes that are subsequently buried by, or covered by the sea, um, and you know, how do people use them, uh, and, and what's the dynamic that's going on in these areas. So you know, I work, as I said, quite a lot in New Guinea, but this is an opportunity to work in that other sort of bridge and barrier, which is Bass Strait. And, um, and so it has a lot of implications for uh, the, the long-term story of, uh, of Australia and the peopling of, of the lands that we, we live in today. So what we know a little bit about is the kind of uh, the shape of the, the islands and, and the shape of the landscape when the sea level is lower. And two um, eminent researchers, Kurt Lambach and John Chappelle, wrote quite a lot about Australia's sea level change. Um, and this is a, a nice little map that shows you just how the current islands and then the, the green is the, the shape of that um, of the Bass Strait lands as as they were exposed during the, the glacial period. And these essentially were, were, were the uh, essential 
uh, bridge to it for people to actually go, come from the mainland and, and into Tasmania and through places like um, the Furno group of islands, Flinders Island, uh, Cape Barren and Clark Island, which we'll talk more about. But that bridge was only open for a certain amount of time and, and probably sometime between about um, 70 and 60,000 years ago and then uh, it was flooded again but then exposed again between about 40,000 and um, around about 8,000 years ago before the current uh, configuration of islands was formed. So we need to know this kind of background information so we can really understand what the records are telling us when we go to these islands. But as, as was mentioned, you know, very uh, privileged to be able to go to the islands and this is kind of a, I hope, a, um, the way a lot of uh, the sort of scientific work can, can actually uh, be conducted in, in our region and, and in this case, um, we were actually working for and with the community um, going there because there was a particular question that was being asked you know, about a large fire, which I'll go into the details of in a minute. But uh, in general, we try and really work in consultation with the local community, um, and in this case, not just um, talking to people and, and getting I their uh, questions and, and ideas, but also going out on, on the country, and in this case, we're exploring for suitable wetlands to take cores and, and that uh, local knowledge of that landscape and where to go to get those sort of cores was essential um, um, from, the, from, that, from the local Aboriginal community there and that was uh, inherent in the success of what, what we do. Once we get the cores of course we take them back to our lab and as a palynologist, somebody that works with microscopic plant remains, um, we look at pollen down the microscope, so extracting it from the sediments and many of you would be familiar with this, some, some less so, but um, essentially it's extracting the tiny microscopic remains that are preserved within these wetlands to reconstruct the past environments that existed there. And so we also look at charcoal as well and this is key to the talk today, is the, the charcoal record, the, the remnants of burning that has gone on in that environment are also preserved alongside these other organic remains. And we're able to date those, put a chronology on them and provide a reconstruction through hundreds and even thousands of years um, uh, in this environment. And the wonderful thing about pollen, it's so um, diagnostic in terms of the species types that are, um, are found in, the, in this environment. And this is just a few examples of Tasmanian pollen types. But essentially, we can distinguish if there's a rainforest or a wood, woodland savanna type environment or a grassland that, that is in, in the local area around the wetland we're studying and by using this, this kind of approach and we were able to reconstruct the vegetation um, associated with that uh, record. So as I mentioned, we're, we're working across, not just um, in this Tasmania example, but right across the region. And, and, and you can use this technique to answer a whole range of questions. We're working with marine cores to try and understand the really long-term climate changes using you know, pollen and charcoal and so on. We're going up to some of the islands to the north of Australia and places like East Timor to look at questions about the monsoon and even human migration from um, you know, Southeast Asia into, a, into uh, the Australian landscape. As I said, working in New Guinea, looking at these big lake systems where we've got rainforest and agriculture, um, rainforest horticulture and strong influences from ENSO variability. We're working uh, in that sort of context. And of course down in this uh, Ferno group we're looking at um, questions surrounding fire management and the long term um, management of that ecosystem uh, by Aboriginal people uh, and how they've adapted to sh that shifting coastline um, environment. And of course we're also not just in these wetland areas but out in the desert as well. We've been recently out in the Mardu homelands looking at um, paleo-environmental, past environment records uh, and how people are actually managing landscapes there today, but also how that, that uh, has changed in the past using a range of other um, different uh, proxies as well. So this kind of work can apply across a whole region and provide important information for these local communities to, to use and to um, you know, understand you know, the longer term history as well. So I'll just give you a couple of little examples of similar work that's been done across Australia, and this is a peculiar view maybe, but it shows um, I'm up at the Australian National University near um, Canberra of course and Lake George is this amazing lake that's up there and, and actually plays an interesting role in this whole story. But of course other areas that I'll talk about today 
um, of course, the Chuana Lung Talana Islands down here, but also um, a record from Lake Salina in Western Tasmania as well will be, will be mentioned. Um, and so just in context, this Lake George is an amazing big basin that captures a lot of uh, uh, proxies such as pollen and charcoal in its sediment, and it's actually the third oldest lake in the world, so it's a remarkable lake um, that was once full, of course, but now is quite um, ephemeral. Uh, but it holds a, a record that's over um, two million years old of, of Australia's environmental change. We were just interested in the very upper bit um, because in that area, work by Gurdip Singh and others back in the 70s and 80s produced the first real record in Australia that looked not only at the vegetation change but what was going on with fire. There was a recognition that fire was important. Um, people didn't really understand... You know, um, white Australian... People didn't really understand the implications of that fire, but they, clearly Gerdip was quite interested in um, what this record held. And what he showed was that actually in the upper parts of that record there was an amazing increase in burning and consistent burning through to the present. Um, the dating was problematic and, and there were issues with the record, but it, he suggested that this was perhaps a record of first uh, peopling of the Australian continent um, because he saw fire increasing and the, the vegetation uh, shifting uh, to, a, to a different fire regime adaptation. And that work continues, actually. We were working at Lake George currently to try and improve the chronology so that story can be um, retold, perhaps, uh, in the future. Here in Tasmania, there are also very long records, one in Lake Salina in west, western Tasmania. Uh, uh, Eric Colhoun uh, worked on that. He also looked at the charcoal and saw that you know, charcoal fluctuates through at least 130,000 years. Um, that area got very cold, obviously, during the last glacial maximum. You've got a sort of alpine environments, but charcoal did increase across that period as well, suggesting that there's a connection between fire and climate, but also potentially um, fire and people in that, in that environment as well. And we've also worked in that uh, Cradle Mountain National uh, Lake Sinclair National Park region, looking at trying to get really high resolution uh, records of charcoal to try and understand that long term, perhaps the last 10,000 or so years um, of fire history. And there we see that there have been very big events of burning in the past, but also um, continued background burning as well. So in this kind of work, we've been able to um, link some of those uh, major fire events, particularly around 4,000, uh, 3,000 years ago, to the onset of perhaps intensified ENSO activity, more droughts, those kind of act, uh, act, uh, climate uh, conditions. But still, there is this long-term fire record. And what's causing that, uh, what's uh, driving that, are some of the questions that um, this sort of research can, can help unravel. We had done a little bit of work in the past on uh, Flinders Island, and there's a record uh, dated back in the 70s by Phil Ladd. Um, we re revisited this site and, and record it and also drew up a, a charcoal record, and this is the charcoal record for Middle Patriarch Lagoon, which is on um, the east coast of Flinders Island. And this, again, shows a period of, of uh, kind of stochastic or periodic major fire events designated by those orange dots over the last 14,000 years or so. Um, showing that yeah, fire is, is an integral part of these in, uh, island environments. And so our, uh, you know, part of the interest in this work is to try and um, flesh that out and understand just the local dynamics and, what, and what's actually going on in these environments. And why is this important? And this comes back to our present day sort of experience, I guess, where and Dave Bowman has been instrumental in sort of sum reviewing this and summarising this, shows that some of the really big fires, and, and Tasmania's been experiencing that in the very recent past, uh, some of these really big fires are uh, not necessarily a global event, but they're concentrated in key parts around the globe. And our area, that southeast Australia, Tasmania, as you can see in this figure here with the red dots, showing that you know, these incredibly intense and, and economically quite devastating fires in the last couple of decades, have really um, concentrated in this in this Tasmania southeast Australia region, and that forebodes the uh, you know, disturbing issue that this may well continue, and we really have to be 
cognisant of what the future holds and part of being uh, aware of that is understanding the past as well. So that's part of our um, sort of goal here, I guess. So that brings us to actually how and, and, and why I was able to work um, uh, with the community on Cape Barren Island and Clark Island uh, and how this came about. And of course in 2014 there was this remarkable catastrophic fire on uh, Lung Talananana, this island, Clark Island, uh, where in September you can see a satellite image of the green cover, um, but then in February 2014, of course, uh, fire began and actually travelled right across the island with only a very small areas that were left untouched. Um, there's a couple of a few houses there in the north and they were protected by local firefighters, um, local community. Um, but in fact, you, know, the, you can see the intensity of these high flames in the background here over a couple of kilometres away, of course, and massive intensity of fire. And so that uh, really did devastate that um, environment in many ways. Uh, but so uh, we were invited, David initially, and then I uh, invited as well to come along to kind of answer these big questions that the community were particularly interested in. What is the frequency of past fire events um, on, on those islands? And has anything like this occurred in the past or not? And what impact might have it had on, the, on that ecosystem? And the work we do can actually help to answer those questions that the community were really concerned about. And it's, you know, those sort of questions are, as I say, are not um, limited, I guess, to, to this Tasmania example. I've been working in um, Victoria as well, in the Grampians, um, where big fires have been a really big issue there, and there are cultural sites um, there. You can see in this right-hand figure, uh, the local community, um, Garawal community, coming together with us and, and discussing, you know, um, how often are these big fires going to occur and how can we actually reconstruct the, um, the, the past fire events to see, to see you know, what the frequency is. And in the Grampians case, of course, they've got lots of rock art um, and rock shelters that the fires now are so intense that they're coming very close to those and the rock art's being shattered and destroyed by intensive fires. So it's front and centre in the minds of the um, Indigenous groups there who are, are wanting to manage this this area in a, in a much more um, knowledgeable way in terms of understanding that past past environment. So they're asking um, scientists and others uh, to come along and, and help in that endeavour. And so that's really the context of going to Clark Island and um, and Cape Barron. And so after the event, um, we went there as a small team. And Anya Nicholson, an honours student graduating from here, came, came along as well um, to do honours work on... Uh, monitoring the extent of the fire and, and measuring the sort of re-sprouting and, and regrowth in that after the major event in 2014. But these photos give you a sense of just how intense and, and widespread that, um, that fire was. There are some plants remaining, there's some colitis there and, and, and so on, but um, you can see even, even some of these are uh, severely impacted. Um, and the wetland drainage as well, of course. The, you can see some of the erosion occurring fairly soon after the fire. The, these issues are, are as well very significant to think about when um, managing that landscape. And what they found in that study, that there was a huge post-fire mortality um, that occurred uh, of the kind of re-sprouting woody plants. And, and um, I think that sort of monitoring is, is probably ongoing, but... Uh, what, what emerges uh, as the, the new vegetation of that island will be um, a very important sort of uh, thing to follow and, and understand what the effects of these really severe fires can be on that vegetation. So yeah, we went there as well, not just to survey the vegetation, but to search for places that would be suitable for these long-term records. And we, um, as you can see from this aerial map here, or uh, photo, but there's a lot of wetlands there, there's quite large lake systems, um, quite ephemeral in some cases in dune field environments, and then coastal lagoons as well, and swamps that uh, are scattered throughout this um, remarkably uh, sort of rich environment in terms of the wetlands that are in, in this area. And this is a snapshot of the north um, eastern part of, of Lung Talananana, and there we went in that 2014 with Andre Sculthorpe and, and the other rangers who were there to actually 
find suitable sites and, and test them for, with our coring equipment and we're able to re retrieve some uh, really nice long records uh, that we've been you know, working on over the last uh, two or three years. So the first step is to find out how old these records are. So we use radiocarbon dating, of course, and those three sites um, return quite different results in terms of their uh, antiquity. And so one up here in the north, uh, and the, the names I'll, I'll add are, were names that were given by the, uh, the groups, that uh, people that were coming going on these little trips. They're just temporary kind of names. Lake Rexy Boy is actually David's um, dog that passed away, I think, three weeks before we got there, and he was telling this story, and then Andre Scott thought, oh, yeah, uh, let's call it Rexy Boy, for, <laughs> just as a code, so these names aren't uh, set in stone, and I'm sure the community will have uh, input into, or tell us what the um, what name they would like to have these, these wetlands called, but um, so at the moment we're just calling them uh, these names in the field. And the, on Cape Barren, we actually worked with, uh, when we did the work, we took uh, school students out um, uh, from the school who were visiting and, and they helped name the sites as well. So that was um, a really fun sort of activity. But what came of these uh, three cores on this island, got a couple that are quite short, only 50, 60 centimetres deep. Um, then you're onto sand substrate. And the one, uh, Rexy Boy Lake, actually went down. Uh, in the end to about four metres deep. And that uh, looks to be well over um, 50,000 years old, but we think, looking at uh, new techniques of dating, that it's probably around 80,000 years old at least. Uh, these shorter cores up on the upland part of the island date back to a, around 8,000 to 6,000 years um, of, of sedimentary record. And all these are being worked on in terms of their uh, fire history and um, plant history. So I'll give you a, sort of the results now from that long core from Rexy Boy. And you'll see here, these are uh, sometimes complex diagrams, but they give you this long record of vegetation and fire and sediment change through time. And these are the dates we have so far, going back to about 40,000 years before present, and uh, an optical stimulated luminescent state on sand particles, uh, suggesting around 80,000 near the base at four metres down. Um, this is a four metre long core and it holds this remarkable long record and very dynamic sediment. You can see an x-ray of the sediment here showing the banding, uh, well stratified sedimentation that goes from um, quite organic through to more inorganic sediment towards the top, it's more clay towards the top. But what's most striking of course is this charcoal record which shows a sort of uh, periodic large um, concentrations of charcoal and then very low amounts through half the record and then as soon as you get to this point here you see this massive increase and constant, constant higher levels of charcoal um, up until about seven or 8,000 years ago and then you get a different kind of record. But what you obviously see here is that when the fire comes in you have a much more open environment, a, a much more perhaps diverse system where you've got um, trees and shrubs uh, as well as these uh, quite diverse open indicators of grass, uh, daisies, um, sedges and so on that actually suggest that the, this environment is much more open during that 40,000 year um, period. And so how might we interpret that? And one way is to try and infer the fire regime that occurs um, in each of these kind of periods. And I've done that essentially here by suggesting that pre-40, 41,000 year um, fire history suggests a quite low frequency but high intensity fires occurring um, and then you shift to a more frequent perhaps low intensity small scale fires occurring in this much more local uh, in the local environment at least or recording in these records uh, what's happening in that catchment of, of Rexy Boy Lake um, and then a shift towards the uh, in that Holocene period towards very low frequency but perhaps small scale fires and then of course European invasion, European colonisation, you get the high, more intensive fires towards the, the very top. So these are the, this is the big sort of picture of what's going on um, in this remarkable record. Here I've just summarised just the trees in, from the pollen record and it shows just focusing on the Myrtaceae, mostly Eucalyptus and uh, Melaleuca, Leptospermum probably, uh, Leptospermum, um, Calitris of course and then Alocasurina 
as the three dominant um, types occurring in the pollen record. And again, one, you see there's responses in the ecosystem to these different fire regimes. Um, perhaps the longer-lived Calitris, uh, or fire-sensitive Calitris um, communities were much more restricted over the last 40,000 years. Still there, of course, but um, certainly the dominance has shifted um, in response to this new fire regime after 41,000. One of the questions is, you know, we can just look at one record and maybe that tells the whole story, but of course that's actually not the case. We, the reason we're wanting to target a whole range of other sites on these islands is to try and get the, see if there's other uh, variables and other changes that occur. We, we, what we see at Rexy Boy, but do they occur right across the other islands? And this is just the charcoal from a couple of other sites, um, one on Flinders and one on um, Clark Island, Banjo. And it's interesting, this uh, Holocene period, when you've got no, no burning evident in Rexy Boy, these other sites actually show periodic burning occurring, suggesting that this lo very low frequency but small-scale fires were still occurring on those islands. And so one of the uh, kind of interesting aspects is what kind of land use or, or uh, occupation history might um, result in that. Uh, we... We know very little about, um, from the archaeology, about the long term or that Holocene history of that region. Uh, perhaps lower populations, perhaps periodic um, visiting the islands. These are the kind of scenarios we can think about. But certainly the fire suggests um, that there's a kind of mosaic pattern of burning occurring. Some places aren't burnt, other places are. And so uh, understanding what impact that's had on the environment will very, be very important as well. And this brings me to the kind of the, what we really want to do, I guess, with, with some of this record and to try and understand um, how these fires impact on diversity and, and, and so on of the ecosystems in these islands. Certainly those big, big fires are clearly quite devastating. The 2014 fire is, you know, knocks a lot of plants out and some of them may not return um, very soon at all. And it's interesting if we turn to an analogue, that one particular analogue, if we go to the central desert, you might think it's unusual to go there, but there's been research there with the Madu community in the central uh, western desert of um, Western Australia, where they've looked at areas where that community actively today um, manages the environment. And you'll see the satellite image of the um, Punga community here, and people from that community walk out and actually burn mosaic um, patterns of, veget of fire management, and you can see in this patch here, in number B, that's the kind of environment that is being currently managed, an manage, uh, environment that's clearly indicated in the satellite image, a, a very diverse and mosaic pattern. In an area where people don't go currently, and haven't done for the last 50 years or so, you see these massive burns here, um, big swathes of, of fire, uncontrolled fire, that um, clearly essentially result in much less diversity um, in the vegetation cover based on this satellite image um, in, in a similar kind of area. And so you might think, look at the sort of analogue here with, with Clark Island, you've got these big burns, a characteristic of this sort of um, environment that's subject to really mega fires. Whereas in areas that are managed regularly and have this mosaic pattern, perhaps less subject to these big fires and, and produce this mosaic pattern. And so my question for, for our research is, you know, can we recreate that in our paleoecological records and to see if we can actually pick up these mosaic patterns that extend right, um, not just over the last few decades, but right through the last few millennia, um, 40 millennia or so. Is this the kind of pattern we'd expect to see on, on the Bass Strait Islands um, through the last 40,000 years of, of occupation? Um, and I think the answer is, would be yes, but we need to go and, and look not just at one site, but many sites on these islands to see if we can look at that mosaic pattern and, and the change in diversity that is ensued from that. So that leads to the next part of the work, and this is um, in 2016-17, rather, we um, were invited to go to Cape Barren Island as well, to Truana, uh, work with the Truana Warrangers, um, because there as well they've experienced these massive burns um, certainly in 2006 and back in the 80s as well, I believe, there were other big fires. Um, and in 2016, some fires were, were there as well. And so 
like um, Clark Island, there are uh, areas that uh, there's wetlands that are uh, suitable for our coring. So we went there to actually core some sites, and here, um, working with Fiona Maher and her and the rangers there, we were able to. They took us around to these various wetlands, of which there are many, but we cored three of them in that trip, um, and we were able to get uh, results from that as well in the very early stages as yet, but still very interesting. And so we went one uh, Toronto East Lagoon on the on the east coast, and many of these lagoons are actually now Ramsar um, protected sites, so there's a lot of information being gathered of about the biology and, and, and so on, and, and the people are very interested in how best to manage those systems as well, and this work will certainly can hopefully contribute to that. Um, bumpy Swamp on the south here, uh, bumpy because it was a very bumpy ride for the school students in the four-wheel drives and so on as we went across the dunes to get there. Um, and then, of course, Big Reedy Swamp, that's a well-known name at a large swamp in the north. And that was a very interesting site. These other sites, again, date back to around six to uh, 5,000 years of sedimentation and will reveal a, a long-term record um, from those. But Big Reedy Swamp dates back to 14,000 years before present and has much longer record. But it has an unusual problem here and it was quite interesting to see this uh, right towards the top of the core we took from there we got a date of around six to seven thousand years old and we were wondering why that was um, we'd have done a lot of work looking at uh, the, the kind of sedimentation and you know the organic chemistry if you like of uh, of, of this uh, core and it confirms um, it's very similar to other cores uh, from the region uh, adapting and changing as the sea level rises, of course, and becoming a, a captured sort of swamp swamp area as it is today. But of course, why are we missing the top um, five or 6,000 years of, of sedimentation? And of course, when you go there, you see this quite remarkable micro topography on, on the surface of that swamp. And so we think, and from what we were told by many people, the, the local rangers there, that swamp actually burnt I think back in the 80s quite extensively and patches of the swamp have clearly lost this top um, 50 or 60 centimetres of, of sedimentation because of a big peat fire that went through there. Now, I think there'll be parts of the swamp that are still intact but we haven't found those as yet. We just went to one, one particular area to get the coring done. But it's, uh, it does signify that you know, the kind of fire regimes and and aspects of environmental change that are happening at the moment can have quite significant effects, impacts on these, on these wetland systems. So it's important to understand those and try and um, uh, look at ways of, of, be of managing these in, in the best way possible. So that's the eastern coast area. We, we also went there and I think you know, the Ramsar um, designation of these uh, wetlands is remarkable and, and the, there's a whole series of little lagoons along that coast that, um, you know, beautiful little lagoons that uh, you know, have, have, have these kind of records contained within in them. And we're in the process now of doing the charcoal and, and working out those, the, the long-term um, record from, from these particular wetlands as well. And that's the bumpy swamp record. It's, again, they all hold uh, quite continuous um, sedimentation, so uh, the story from Big Reedy Swamp I don't think will be uh, repeated in any others cause, uh, as far as we're aware, but again, we'll be looking, looking for those kind of indicators. And here's some of the kind of potential, I think. There's some really remarkable um, wetlands there, and this is just the image of some of those, particularly on the east coast. Many of, the, many of them looking in their shape and morphology as a bit like the Rexy Boy lagoon that we went to. So I wouldn't be surprised if we go there, if we can go there again, we might actually find, again, a really long 80,000 or more record um, of environmental change on um, Truana, uh, Cape Barren Island. Um, but this is in the early stages of that uh, kind of exploration and we hope to be working with the Truana Rangers in to um, be able to go down to some of these areas. It's quite remote and not so easy to get to. I think boating around to there and camping with the way that will have to be done. Um, but I think you know, the potential of, of getting some really interesting results from that region uh, is very exciting. And so, yeah, just to finish off, I'd just yeah, reiterate that uh, a lot of this work is 
all about partnerships and, and you know, we took school kids out and spoke at the local school as well um, on Cape Barren and you know, everybody's you know, very engaged and, and really wants to know, uh, uh, you know the kind of, uh, what, what this kind of research can, can reveal and I'm hoping that um, what I've been able to present today has really kind of given a sense that uh, these records are, are really significant and they hold a remarkable history of, of uh, local Aboriginal management of landscapes so that not is, goes back to uh, you know, at least 41,000 years before present. Um, and of course through that period there's been changes in the land management and land use uh, due to sea level changes and so on. But essentially that long uh, association and, and um, management of that landscape is not a recent thing but something that goes back, like I say, 40,000 years. And a, a really amazing story to, to be able to, uh, to tell, I think. And so, yeah, I'd just like to thank the uh, partners in this work, the Tasmanian Aboriginal Centre and the Aboriginal Land Council of Tasmania and the Toronto Rangers. And there have been a, a range of other people working in the, in the lab, uh, doing the analysis, the radiocarbon chronologies and the cut charcoal, uh, pollen and other geochemical work, um, all coming together to really uh, create... Uh, this, this uh, reconstruction of that environmental change um, over this long period. So thank you and I'm happy to take questions. So do we have any questions for Simon? Simon, was there much difference between Phil um, Ladd's uh, call up on Flinders and the project you had? Uh, there was a few things. I think um, we were able to... Um, I mean, Phil, Phil uh, had a fairly small um, reference collection, I guess, for the island. We've expand, expanded the pollen diversity that we are able to recognise, so we're able to expand that aspect of what we're doing. But essentially, those the changes he saw, uh, he only, I think, did 10 samples through that course. So it's, um, but the big changes he saw were very similar, and um, some of the fire patterns he saw also uh, you know, were similar to what we found. So, so yeah, there was uh, a lot of similarities between those records and that early work of Phil's was quite amazing. He went through a number of sites in uh, Flinders and, and did a number of records. Uh, so it's sort of groundbreaking work, I think, that he okay. started. Great. Um, I'd just like to take technical time, please, just have a look at the Body site. Which is European, the European column. Is it really European? Because you know, like if, if you look at the thing profile, it goes a long way down below the European, but that might be a little dated. That's problem. probably the, that's the way. Yeah, it's. Uh, I suppose I'm wondering. Illustrated. If if you look in detail, it's the top two and a half centimeters that actually has pinus in there as well. Yeah, okay. So we are linking the European phase with you know, planting of pines, which pe you know, people obviously did when they uh, first came to that, that island and uh, so, so yeah I think it's a quite it's a quite a clear mark of European um, occupation. I suppose I was wondering there was an issue there that uh, you have pure accumulation through time that um, through that 7,000 years you've got accumulation and accumulation of fuel and it actually looked very much like the record from before 40,000 yeah. except they had these intermittent spikes. <laughs> yeah yeah so that's, that's right kind of wondering, you know, whether it's actually almost mimicking even with that European signal it might be almost mimicking the natural uh, yeah. whatever you mean by natural or tree. Yeah, uh, look, there's clearly it's, uh, at this site it's a very low there's virtually no fire around that site for some, you know, four or five thousand years. Um, but we found on other, and this is why we went to the other records and we'll be looking at the other records, there's clearly burning going on across the island in other sites in very localised um, senses. So this could be a result of occasional visits to the island for management, for birds, for whatever, or yeah, we're, we're um, open to discussion and, and interpretation of that, and that's something that all you know, with the community will work through to try and work out what's going on. One thing you might want to say um, is you know, very arresting, particularly after the 
severe fire is it's the number of archaeological sites that we saw that I mean, there's no question of human presence it's yeah. extremely um, like it has a really strong impact on you to see so many stone tools and sites so um, you know there's yeah, you know, it's really in your face that this is a human, la humanized landscape. It's really confronting. Um, yeah. Um, just a, I guess, a comment on um, the two lakes. It's, it's really quite clear. It's quite interesting that the um, you really um, picking out two views of um, dune instability between the penultimate and. commented on that in more detail because it was quite a good example of essentially ocean sea level rise above the present probably driving coastal dune or now coastal dune formation and, and lakes behind it. Yeah, and I think the dunes on that whole island because we had uh, colleague Paul Hess come down to try and do OSL dating through some of those dunes but there he found it very difficult for a whole range of reasons I think but um, to get good results but I think one of the essential things is that because they're so stable and have been there for an incredibly long period of time um, across the in interior of that island. Um, yeah, but I think the coastal, that, that'll be certainly something we want to look at because we've got very good grain size records through the cores and we should be able to look at any periods when there are periods of mobilisation of sands and, and so on. Um, so I'm quite interested in that issue. Uh, but I think they are very, yeah, they're, they're big, they're massive and um, I think they've been there for a very long time through the glacial period. So, so yeah. Chris has a question. Uh, I wonder if you could just comment on the problem of uh, distinguishing frequency and intensity of the charcoal record, which must depend yeah. on your sampling resolution and stuff. That's right. So, can, um, well, how confident are you that, that those shifts are? So that, that was, yeah, they were inferred by regimes that I'm talking about there. So there are various ways of, and I didn't go into the detail, but statistical approaches to um, trying to decouple at least the frequency from these records. And we can look at the background and then uh, unusually high peaks to give a sense of the, the peak frequency through time. And that's, what, that's one of the ways of doing that. Um, but obviously we also infer from the vegetation that's there as well. So uh, clearly, uh, the restriction of colitis suggests that there's more frequent burning, uh, but it still persists colitis in the in the record through the present. So it's not so frequent or intense that it will eliminate some of these fire sensitive plants. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's some inference required there. What's exciting though, and what I'm ho hopefully we're able to apply to some of these records, is some new techniques in terms of actually determining what heat. Uh, was required to produce that speck of charcoal we're looking at under the microscope. And you actually can use um, some new Fourier transmission infrared spectrox spectroscopy, um, a new technique to actually determine at what degree Celsius a particular bit of charcoal has been produced at. Um, Mike Bird in James Cook University has also got um, hydrolysis techniques that uh, are also looking at, you know, low intensity, high intensity charcoal uh, production. So I'm very confident in the end we'll be able to get a record of just how intense some of these fires were in terms of their temperature um, uh, over time and the, the cool burn versus, versus sort of wildfire hot burn scenario is something we should be able to actually reconstruct with these new techniques and I think yeah, that'll be incredibly in, uh, informative I think about improving our understanding of the fire histories of, of the region. I think we might uh, draw this yeah. conversation to a close because there's Something. going to be demand for the lecture theatre. Um, so yeah, to, to recap, uh, thank you very much, Simon, and, and thank, thank you, Bobby. Um, you really emphasise this is a, a collaborative project. It's an <coughs> extraordinary honour to be involved in this project um, and to be invited so uh, with so much welcome.
in, into that country um, and to, to explore this journey together. Uh, this is really it's, it's just to re-emphasise sort of an update. Simon's doing some reports back to the community. It's a big project that's going to be going on for, for many more years. Um, so hopefully we can have Simon back for further update. Have you guys back and, uh, as we're sharing this story. So thank you everybody for coming. And Simon will be around um, and he's got an email address there if you're really inspired to send him an email and certainly he'll find time to answer it in amongst being a senior administrator in a large <laughs> uh, university. Okay. Well thank you everybody.